Canada. What a huge landmass we have with oceans on three sides and our friendly United States neighbors to the south. This is a bilingual country with English and French as the two official languages. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Welcome to Canada. Bienvenue. Um, most people who speak French live in the province of Quebec, but that's not. we also have French-speaking people all across this great country. The founding peoples of Canada were really Aboriginal, First Nations Canadians who built this land well before many of us were here from Europe. So just to give you the context, we are a confederation with a national constitution, 10 provinces and three territories. The federal government has jurisdiction over national issues and that includes a national health plan, uh, health act, which actually is, is universal health care. Unlike our neighbors to the south, we actually have universal health care. Provinces have responsibility to deliver social and health services, and disability tends to fall under social services, and aging tends to fall under health. So this is our first great Canadian paradox. So as Canadians age, you can tell what's going to happen because we're going to have two ministries uh, bumping into each other and trying to figure out how we're going to support people. The federal government has tinkered with disability issues over the years. They don't really have responsibility for disability and aging issues. Um, so they've tinkered with it. They funded employment and inclusion in issues for more than 20 years. And some of that has been very important, especially for the community living movement in terms of building capacity in communities. And they've actually funded a national mental health commission, which has been really important. And it's the only disability that has a national commission. Um, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada is, has research funds, education funds, and capacity to support community-based mental health across the country. And we don't have that in any other area of disability. So that'll be a really interesting uh, process to watch. The federal government of Canada, I think all of you Canadians would agree, they seldom set standards and targets, especially in the last nine years of our current government. And as a result, there's wide variation across Canada among the provinces in terms of self-determination, individualized funding, home care, and I'm sad to say there's wide variation also in terms of quality of supports that people get. You can be in one province and actually have very seamless and connected individualized funding or home care and be in another province and not get either. There's one exception to the federal government lack of involvement in terms of this, and that's what is, is called the Registered Disability Savings Plan. And I want to just talk about that briefly for those of you from other countries, because it was really a program designed eight years ago to reduce the poverty of Canadians with disability. And the program was really developed by uh, uh, the treasurer at the time, Minister Flaherty, who since died, and some folks from BC, actually, who really developed a very exciting program. And the idea of the program is that the federal government will match any investments, any money that families or individuals put in. And so if we put in, let's say for my daughter, starting at age 16, if I put in $1,500 a year, the government will match that, plus they'll top it up with a bonus. So if you think about it, over a 25-year period with significant invest investments from the person and from the government, long-term savings can be significant. So we're really saying that this income strategy has the potential to enhance self-determination, autonomy, and choice. We really haven't seen the results yet, but we think it's a very exciting, potentially, initiative to reduce the poverty of Canadians with disabilities and therefore enhance self-determination. There's three other things I want to touch on very briefly. I don't have time to go into them, but I think they really build on what Michael talked about yesterday. And if we don't deal with these three things in some significant fashion, we're going to go down that slippery slope that Michael talked about. And the first is we have a rapidly aging population. By the year 2030, it's estimated that 24% of us will be over 65. Imagine that. So there'll only be four Canadians working for every, or four, one Canadian working for every four Canadians over 65. And in the 1970s, that was one to eight. So that's a big, big issue in addition to the issues that Michael talked about. We have extensive inequality in Canada, although you'd never know it. We have a national election on Monday, and there's been very little talk about inequality. But we have huge inequality in this country. 
especially among Native Canadians who have less education, less income, and in some ways the way we've worked with and treated and supported Native Canadians has been shameful. And thirdly, we have high unemployment of people with disabilities. So what are the roots of self-determination in Canada? I just want to mention that briefly because the roots are really out of the independent living movement. And I know there's some folks here from that movement that really started in the early 1980s when the independent living movement in Canada talked about consumer direction and control and how important that is. And those roots really have stayed with people with physical disabilities deeply in this country. The community living movement that Michael talked a lot about yesterday has focused more on person-centered approaches which to some extent have influenced and impacted self-determination, but I think very little in some ways. But interestingly, in some provinces, there's a movement toward more person-directed supports, which I think begins to shift us more emphatically into the realm of self-determination. And the aging movement in Canada has been very concerned about pensions, home care, and as you heard so articulately from Jim Mann yesterday, voice and choice. So let me talk very briefly about the three key approaches to building citizenship and self-determination in Canada. Individualized funding, support network development, and independent planning and facilitation. So individualized funding. We have policy frameworks and funding mechanisms in some provinces, but we can say that none of them actually are very comprehensive as yet. We have evolving policy and limited funding mechanisms in other provinces. But quite frankly, in most of those provinces that are listed there, the, the options are very limited for individuals and families. And we have very slow implementation in other provinces. So what's the process and impact of individualized funding? I think it's mixed. We have pockets of excellence. We have pockets of some really good programs. But the, it's very slow to shift to what I call a new story. Very slow shift. And one of the ways you can judge that is to look at the budgets, the overall budgets for people with disabilities in different provinces. And in most provinces, the budgets are going around 3 to 5 percent of total budgets are for individualized funding. I think Ontario is the highest at about 8 or 9 percent. I think we're often stuck in techniques. We love techniques in Canada. We're often stuck in techniques, so we spend a lot of time figuring out how do we assess people. We spend a lot of time thinking that planning is going to be the new sliced bread. In preparation for today, I talked to several leaders across the country, and many of them said that one of the problems is that IF is often too complicated. And in some provinces, I was told that families aren't trusted, and so the policies that are put in place, in fact, don't really empower families and individuals. And I think what we've learned over the last 10 or 12 years which will not, not surprise any other countries, is that money is not enough. So what else is there besides money? Well, one of the great things that we've done in Canada, thanks to Judith Snow and others, her legacy that you just heard about, is we have significant work done on support networks and relationship building. And I just want to, to hopefully not offend anybody that I left off this list, but these are some of the organizations that have done really excellent work in support network development, Plan and its affiliates, micro boards in British Columbia, Innovative Life Options in Manitoba, and several organizations in Ontario, including Families for a Secure Future. And I think we can say with some of the evaluations that have happened in Canada that the impact of support networks is actually very significant, especially in terms of inclusion and relationships. The problem is that these are pockets of excellence. And so our challenge is really to how do we expand those pockets of excellence? Because we know that in addition to individualized funding, one needs a strong network and strong relationships to build a life in community. Independent facilitation and planning is really about a vulnerable person benefiting from somebody walking with them in their journey to claim an everyday life. The word facilitators, as some of you would have used the word broker or support coordinators, or we're using the word more and more as facilitator. It's think, thinking about a person who's a navigator supporting people to nurture self-determination and to respond to self-determination. And we're gradually getting across Canada a small number of independent facilitation organizations that are su supporting this emerging craft. And I think it's fair to say that the craft is really grounded in self-determination and community. 
So it's really both. It's about how do we build self-determined choices, but how do we always make it happen in community? There's some roots of facilitation in British Columbia, New Brunswick, Manitoba, but the deep roots now are in the province of Nova Scotia, where several key leaders are driving the change and working in a collaborative way with government that has now funded seven small independent facilitation organizations. So that's going to be a really important uh, piece of work to watch over the next couple of years. There's helpful resources that are available if any of you are interested through the Individualized Funding Coalition for Ontario that has really mapped this work out over, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, maybe 25 years. And a new organization which is really kind of oversight for some of the independent facilitation work, the Ontario Independent Facilitation Network. So let me finish by identifying um, some issues that I think Canada is facing in terms of really enhancing citizenship and self-determination. I think the first issue we're facing is that it's very challenging to move from the old story to what I would call a new story. We're good builders in Canada. We built a terrifically big traditional service system and now we're finding it's hard to change it. It's very hard to change it. And the other problem is Canadians are polite and you all know that, right? We're polite, we go around the world and we're seen as being polite, civilized people. The problem is what that sometimes means is we wait for government. We hope government's going to do what we really wish they would do. But we know, we know that the significant changes in Canada have always had strong leadership. And really, two kinds of leadership. One kind of leadership which is about advocacy and education and articulating what that vision is and persuading other people about what that vision is and what the steps are to get to that vision. But the other kind of leadership which is equally important, which we're kind of rediscovering, is leadership on the ground in local communities where people work together and have conversations together to figure out how they can build something different. And so I think one of our leadership challenges in Canada is to build, to scale up the pockets of innovation and to invest in social innovation. And I'm really pleased to say that there's a couple of provinces, British Columbia and Ontario, particularly governments that are starting to invest in social innovation, to see that in the long term, if you invest in social innovation, you actually create the change that you want. We also need community development, and you know Canada has a very rich history of community development. And we need to reassert that, we need to redevelop it, and build and have community conversations about what the possibilities are for a new story. The good news is that some governments are collaborating with community leaders, Saskatchewan, Ontario are two examples, and we need to build on this. We need to build on that example of government and community working together to create the change that we all want. And finally, I think we need a pan-Canadian set of guidelines that would serve to inspire and support provincial initiatives. Not that the federal government is going to do all the activity, but they could inspire everybody to do what needs to be done. I want to just finish with a quote from Grace Lee Boggs, who some of you will know, the great American, not Canadian, American activist, and I, I chose her because she died last week at age 100. And Grace used to often say, Grace used to often say, love isn't about what we did yesterday, it's about what we do today and the day after. And when I think about our leadership challenge in Canada is to really mobilize people for change because we have such great pockets of innovation and it's really to build on those and move them ahead. And so let's think about what Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's what he said to his followers over and over. And so we need to say that to each other as Canadians and build those local possibilities as we work with our governments to create the change we need.